let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and His faithfulness to all generations. I need thee, oh bless 
Christ, me now my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thy indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Thee, Lord, I need Thee. My Savior, I come to Thee. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary Tried by sinful men Torn and beaten then Nailed to a cross of wood This the power of the cross Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome of sin, every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow, this the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame. We stand forgiven at the cross. Now the daylight keeps, now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead or raised to life, finished the victory. Cry. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. suffering, I am free. Death is crushed to death, life is mine to live, one through your selfless love. This the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a what a cause we stand forgiven at the cross. All things work for our good. Sometimes we don't see how they could Struggles that break our hearts in two Sometimes blind us to the truth Our Father knows what's best for us 
His ways are not our own. So when your pathway grows dim and you just don't see Him, remember you're never alone. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. He sees a master plan, and He holds our future in His hand. So don't live as those who have no hope All our hope is found in Him We see the present clearly But He sees the first and the last And like a tapestry He's weaving you and me To someday be just like Him. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. He alone is faithful and true. He alone knows what is best for you. When you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. Bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we do praise you. You are Lord of heaven and earth. You are creator. You are creator of man. When we look at the beauty of this world, we remember how great you are, how worthy of praise you are, and we praise you. Lord God, today we live in a troubled world. There is so much difficulty, Lord God. We are going through hard times. And we do not know when this COVID will end. But Lord God, may it be that you strengthen us, Lord God, so that we will continue walking by faith. We will walk with you. Not one step, not two steps, but throughout. Father God, we pray for your encouragement upon those who are discouraged, those who are weak, those who are struggling. Lord, may you help them to sense your presence, that they may once again be encouraged, be strengthened. May they also encourage and strengthen others. Father God, we pray for UECG. May we not lose sight of that vision that you have given us. May we not lose focus on that commission that you have given us. We are to go and make disciples of all nations. May UECG be faithful to that commission. Yes, today and for always. COVID or no COVID, may we be your instrument in bringing people to Jesus Christ, following Him and being His disciples. Father God, may we be faithful until we meet our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Our scripture for today is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. The full assurance of faith. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hello there, brothers and sisters. Let me start off by asking you a question. Do you know where UECG is? I'm sure you must think that's a pretty stupid question. For the longest time, we tend to think of UECG in terms of the building. So we think of UECG as being at J. De Mesa here in San Juan. But when you go to our J. De Mesa building right now, chances are you won't meet anyone else other than the guard. While the building has its purpose, this COVID has reminded us that the church is not the building, but the people. It's you and me. It's us. Where is UECG? It's where you are, where we are together. COVID has moved us online at our Sunday Facebook and YouTube worship, in our weekly Zoom meetings, Viber, Messenger meetings, and even in those daily text, Viber, WeChat, and other messages that we send to each other. That's where UECG has been for years, but never more so than right now when we can physically meet. Today's passage tells us, let's go on. Let's not stop that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, Lord, as we study your word today, once again, Lord, we call on you. Be our teacher, Lord God. Speak to us that we may not simply understand, but more importantly, apply what we learn. Father, thank you, Lord, for being our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in Old Testament times, we know that the temple was composed of the courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies, or sometimes called the most holy place. The holy of holies was the innermost and most sacred part of the temple. It was separated from the holy place by a thick curtain that's four inches thick. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 to 4 and 6 to 7 says this. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. The regular priests go regularly into their first section, which is the holy place, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, which is the holy of holies, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Inside the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, signifying the very presence of God. As mentioned, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies and only once a year. No one else was allowed inside, not even the other priests. And the high priest went in only after very meticulous cleansing rites, 
Otherwise, he would violate God's holiness. He had to offer a sacrifice to purify himself before purifying the Israelites. Then he entered the holy place or most holy place with much fear, much trembling. Why trembling? Remember, he was going into the holy presence of God. And if he entered it in an unworthy manner, he could die. At this point, I'd like to talk a bit more about God's holiness. Because I think today we often take this topic for granted. We don't understand how serious it is that God is holy and we are not. Unless we get a good grasp of His holiness, we won't appreciate what today's passage is telling us. When Moses was on Mount Sinai meeting with God, the Lord gave him this warning. In Exodus 19.12 it says, And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. And also, remember the scene when Isaiah had a vision of God? It says this, And one angel called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God is a holy God. In contrast, in the New Testament, things are different. For this New Testament Hebrew believers, the author gives two reasons for them to be confident. In Hebrews 10, 19 to 21, which is our passage, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, you see, the people, those New Testament believers, they had a new and living way. This word, confidence, appears multiple times in the book of Hebrews. It meant free and fearless confidence. It meant cheerful courage boldness, and assurance. I remember when we were children, I was probably in grade 6 then, a neighbor invited me and a few of other kids over to their house for a birthday party. We were very hesitant about going, but our mom encouraged us to go. So we went. It was only a three-minute walk, and we walked single file. We were pushing each other who would go first. We were almost at the neighbor's house when their youngest daughter, who was probably four or five years old then, came out. Upon seeing us, she said, Bakit kayo nandito? All of us turned around and started walking back home. We were the exact opposite of entering with confidence. Fortunately, the mom came out and ushered, that, ushered us in, assuring us that we were welcome. Why were we so fearful? Because we felt we didn't belong there. Here in our passage, the author says that they had confidence to enter. Notice it was a statement of fact. They had confidence. Where did the confidence come from? It was by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened through the curtain that is through His flesh. Note again that this was something that's already done. Look what happened when Jesus died on the cross. In Mark 15 verse 37, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed His last. Verse 38, The curtain of the temple 
was torn in two from top to bottom. When Jesus died, the curtain inside the temple was torn from top to bottom. That's the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies. This signified that unlike before, where there was a barrier between God and man, now the way was open for sinful man to approach God with confidence. The old way of the law, the, sacrifice, the sacrificial system, didn't bring confidence. Because the sacrifices didn't bring lasting purification. So there was almost, well, there was always uncertainty and fear. That's why there were many different kinds of offering. Some for unintentional sins, some for intentional sins. And these had to be repeated again and again because people didn't stop sinning. The inside, the heart hadn't been changed and cleansed. But Jesus put an end to this. On the cross, Christ's flesh was torn. His blood was shed for us. The curtain was torn. The barrier between God and man had been removed. When people come to Christ, their sins are forgiven and they can approach God freely because God no longer saw them as sinners but saw them with the righteousness of Jesus Christ on them. A second reason for confidence was that they had a great high priest. The unique thing about Jesus was that he was not simply the sacrificial lamb, but he was also the priest. Not only had he opened the door to God, he was there leading the way to God. A priest unlike any other. The Greek words here translated great priest can also mean high priest. In this book of Hebrews, the author has been establishing that Jesus is greater than any other. So he was not just a great priest. He was not just a high priest. He was the greatest high priest. He was sinless. Unlike normal human high priests, he did not need to offer any sacrifice for his own sin because he did not have any sin. He does not make mistakes. We can be confident in him. Unlike our human leaders, you know, leaders like us, no matter how skilled, how knowledgeable, how well-intentioned, we tend to fail. We are weak and we tend to disappoint. Jesus won't disappoint. As great high priest, he continuously intercedes for the people. And his commitment is unquestionable. It was proven on the cross. And Jesus' high priestly position was eternal. His term as high priest was endless. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 7, it says, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. That is our great high priest. The Hebrew believers were going through much difficulty and were getting discouraged. They were facing the prospect of increased persecution. They were on the verge of giving up, so the author wanted them to be encouraged and to develop confidence, to not give up, to continue on, Knowledge of what Christ had done for them and what he's doing as priest should bring this confidence. And this confidence is ours as well. Brother and sister, are you getting discouraged? Are you facing a situation that's causing you to want to give up on your faith and maybe even of life? Look to the cross. Be reminded of what Jesus came to do for us and what He had accomplished. 
He opened the door for us to freely approach God so that we can come to God anytime. He is acting as our priest to mediate for us and to bring us close to God. So that whatever wrong we may have done, we can still come to God. He will accept us. Knowing these things, what are we to do? The passage continues in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are called to respond in three ways. Firstly, we are called to draw near to God, the assurance of a clean conscience. Second, we are called to hold fast to His faithfulness. We are given the stability of a faithful God. And thirdly, we are called to draw near to each other, to receive encouragement from a godly family. So first, we are called to draw near to God with the assurance of a clean conscience. Brothers and sisters, is your conscience bothered by any sin you'd committed in the past? Is this hindering you from coming to God? In view of what Christ had accomplished on the cross, we can approach God with assurance of forgiveness. He does forgive completely, permanently. He will not use our sins against us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 to 18, the author quotes an Old Testament prophecy which says this, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then, he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. That was a prophecy of what the Messiah was going to do. And by the time of the book of Hebrews, he had done it. In the Old Testament, Moses would take the blood of the sacrificial animal and sprinkle it on the people. Now, we are sprinkled clean by Christ's blood. What are some of the sins that keep bothering you? Let's take a moment to think about that. By God's grace, if you belong to Christ, they are all forgiven. The blood of Christ has set you free. Our second response is to hold fast to His faithfulness. To hold fast to the stability of a faithful God. You know, I grew up studying in a Christian school. So I heard the gospel from early in my life. I accepted Christ while still very young, but even then, I always feared that because I'd commit sins again, and though I already accepted Jesus, He might leave me because of my new sins. So I would accept Christ again at the end of every day, until one day I understood that you only need to accept Christ once, because when He forgives, he does so once and for all. I wouldn't say I had assurance of salvation from that point on, but I kept growing in my assurance of salvation as I came to know God's Word more and more. And I never accepted Jesus Christ a second time after that. If you have accepted Christ, Trust that He has saved you 
and live as a child of your Father. Do not doubt anymore. God, your Savior, is faithful. And the third response that God wants from us is to draw near to each other, to receive and give encouragement to and from a godly family. Finally, the author has one last instruction for the Hebrew believers. Draw near to each other. We often call this fellowship. Coming together for accountability and encouragement. More than ever, during those times that they were going through much suffering, instead of withdrawing from each other, they needed to stick together. A Christian man had been regularly attending their men's Bible study for a time. Then he gradually became irregular in his attendance and eventually stopped altogether. One day the pastor visited him at his home and found him seated in front of a lit fireplace. The pastor didn't say anything. He just sat there with this man. They sat there a while until the pastor got up, went to the fire, and with a pair of tongs, took out a burning piece of wood and set it aside. In a short time, the fire on this piece of wood died out. The pastor then got up and put it back into the fire. It quickly reignited. The man got the message the pastor was trying to convey. As the pastor was leaving, the man assured him that he'll start joining the group again. He needed to be in fellowship with the other men. We need to keep meeting together, if not live, at least online. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Brothers and sisters, how are you? How's your faith in the Lord? Whatever it is you're going through, are you confident in your relationship with the Lord? Through what Jesus had done, draw near to God in confident assurance. Spend time with Him, knowing He wants to spend time with you. And spend time with your fellow believers, both to give and to receive encouragement. Yes, let me repeat that, to give and to receive encouragement. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. But He is coming back soon. And that thought should encourage us even more to meet with each other, to encourage each other. Brothers and sisters, go ahead and send those messages to our members to show your love for them. We have a member who thoughtfully sends a good morning greeting every morning with a picture of a very beautiful flower. Message someone you don't know well, just to say hi, just to get to know them, or even someone in the family circle whom you don't know at all. You might consider sending someone food by surprise, just to encourage them. If you're already part of a small group, keep joining, don't stop and actively participate, giving and receiving. If you are not yet part of a group, approach us so we can help plug you into one or even possibly form one for you. Aside from this, let's do what we can to help support our fellow Christians. Join our Wednesday, Wednesday night weekly prayer meeting via Zoom. That's a way of encouraging one another. Let me also encourage you to open yourself to other people's help. Don't feel shame at accepting help. 
in our culture, there is that sense of not wanting to inconvenience other people. That's a kind of pride. We should not let pride or shame keep us from accepting help when we need it. That's what church family is all about. As we end, please listen to how a family experienced practical help when they needed it most. Good day, brothers and sisters. I am Johnny. And I am Gemma. Today, we want to share with you our experience as COVID-19 victims. After having flu-like symptoms and a test for dengue came out negative, I was tested positive for COVID-19. During those times, prayer requests were sent to family members, dear friends, Bible study and accountability groups, and church mates. More than the physical conditions, worry and stress that came with it, I am very concerned about my family. I am trusting God that they will not get infected by me, but God had another plan. After Johnny tested positive, the city health doctor scheduled our swab test. After three days, the result came out positive for all of us. Thankfully for our children, symptoms were mild. I was the only one asymptomatic. Gradually, their health improved after following the health and safety protocol guidelines. What did we learn as a family from this experience? First, there was denial. We simply cannot believe that our family got infected. Then came acceptance. Yes, it can happen to all of us, no matter how you protect yourself. During the time of isolation, the threat of physical death has never been more real to us. Every day is a blessing from the Lord to wake up and still be with your family. We learn to rely on God's presence through reading the Word of God, listening to Christian music, family prayer time, and to quiet our hearts and mind at night, we listen to the Word of God. God's presence is so real, He alone is our constant companion. We are thankful to our family, friends, Bible study, and accountability groups, UECG church members and pastors who show love and care to our family. We appreciate our pastors and Bible study accountability groups for praying with us by calling us every now and then. Our pastor even volunteered to drive us in the hospital when we went for another checkup. Your encouragement and prayers kept us strong and alive in Christ. As Psalm 91 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Thank you and God be the glory. Yes. Thank you, Johnny and Gemma, for your testimonies. And thank you, brothers and sisters, for the help that you have extended to them in their time of need. Here are the discussion questions. Number one, do you think of UECG as your spiritual family? Why or why not? And two, what can we all do to improve as a family. Brothers and sisters, let's prepare our hearts to partake the communion. i 
covenant with us we remember and worship you oh Lord we remember all you've done for us we remember your sacrifice for us Lord we Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. After supper, he took the cup and he said, This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's part of the cup. Indeed, Lord Jesus, if not for your love, if not for your sacrifice, where would we be? We would be hopeless, lost. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope.